Today's book is The Land of Stories, uh, The Wishing Spell. Uh, Land of Stories, I guess, is the name of the series. The Wishing Spell is the name of this entry in the series. It's the first book in the series. So, Land of Stories, The Wishing Spell by Chris Colfer. Colfer? Colfer? Um, right. So, why am I reviewing this book? Or probably the question you're wondering is why am I, as a grown man, reviewing this book? So I don't want to spend too much time on this because this is just unique to me, but I'll kind of make my excuses briefly. I have, over the past couple years, uh, you know, I try and read kind of serious books, but I've come to the conclusion that my brain, such as it is, will only kind of let me focus on serious books for certain portions of the day. As kind of the day goes on, my concentration gets less, and kind of after work or after nine o'clock, I've got nothing left. Uh, at which point I tend to just spend a lot of time on the computer watching YouTube or watching TV, and uh, I thought uh, all this screen time isn't good for me. So if I can't concentrate on serious books, I decided I'd, I'd just kind of get some light reading. Um, now, I'm also, I'm living abroad. I'm not living back in the US. I've been living in Vietnam for the past few years. And kind of anywhere in Asia, really, the selection of English books is limited. So, you know, if I went to, into a bookstore back home, you know, like one of those big Barnes & Noble bookstores, there'd just be rows and rows of books. And I'd, you know, I'd find five books on kind of my own pet interest or I'd get a fantasy book for adults or something like that if I just wanted to waste time. Uh, in Vietnam, they do have a lot of fantasy books, but they tend to be kind of children's fantasy books. So I'm limited by selection. So, yeah, with those excuses out of the way, I was kind of looking through the bookshelves and, you know, I admit to being charmed by this. It's, uh, I don't, I don't know. I know this is kind of going for a younger demographic, but it kind of presented a kind of enchanting world that I thought might be kind of fun to visit, you know? castle, a fairy tale land, a frog in a suit, a scary wolf, Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, kind of all the princesses and fairy tale worlds, fairies here, and I thought, yeah, I, I, I like immersing myself in these kind of fantasy worlds. I guess I, I just have that temperament. And so I thought, yeah, this could be fun. Oh, and there's also like a map here of the the fairy tale kingdoms which i looked at that map and it looked like kind of like a fun world to immerse myself in um so i bought the book as i was walking out of the shopping mall uh this bookstore is part of a larger shopping mall i ran into a couple of co-workers and we were chatting and they said oh what did you buy and i said okay before you judge me I'm reading a lot of serious classic books at the moment. This is just kind of unwind in the evening. But I showed it to them, and one of them looked at it and he's like, oh, that's the guy from Glee. I didn't even realize that. Uh, but like, there's a small picture of him on the back, which didn't kind of clue me into it, just from the small picture. But this is, in fact, I looked this up on Wikipedia when I got home. This is the guy from Glee. Uh, it doesn't say that anywhere here on the novel. Like, it doesn't say that anywhere on the book or on the book jacket. No, it doesn't say it anywhere. But yeah, it's, it's a guy from Glee. Also, I was looking this up on Wikipedia. This book is a few years old. I'm behind the times. I think it came out in 2012. At the time which, uh, this guy was only 25 years old. So, uh, once I realized that, I was like, ah... Uh, Great. Like another actor who thinks he's a writer. Uh, this book is probably not going to be great. But I, I guess I'm going to kind of spoiler to, to jump ahead to my uh, assessment of it. It's not half bad. I mean, it's not Shakespeare or anything, but it's not half bad. It's perfectly serviceable. So, you know, it's unfair how some people have all the talent that he's both a successful actor and a successful writer. Grr, why are some people so talented? But like, uh, yeah, the, the, the book works. It works 
Okay. Uh, so, where to start with the review? Um, okay, yeah, I'll just kind of start at the beginning, I guess. Uh, the book gets off to a little bit of a slow start. We don't really get into the land of stories until about 80 pages in. The first kind of couple chapters are about these two twins, Alex and Connor, and their kind of problems at home. Their father died. They've had to kind of, you know, the mother's having financial trouble and is overworked. Uh, Connor doesn't do well at school and the teacher picks on him and blah, 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 blah. And it's just a little bit slow kind of getting through there. But then it does kind of pick up on page 80 when they get into the land of stories. Um, a complaint, maybe, is that the kids do not talk at all like real kids talk. Um, the, the, yeah, the, the sister is supposed to be the smart one and the brother is kind of the more kind of relaxed one. And the brother sounds a little bit more natural, but he's still quite stilted. The sister does not sound like a kid at all. And I know that's somewhat intentional, like she's supposed to be the brainiac of the two. But it, uh, it's just not how kids talk at all. Uh, they, you know, they talk like they're, like they're writing a formal essay, not like they're talking real dialogue. Um, but I forgave that because I think a lot of children's literature, the kids never talk like real people in a lot of kids' books. I mean, the Hardy Boys, did the Hardy Boys really talk like real boys? Like a lot of kids literature children's literature they don't sound like real people so you just kind of have to forgive it um go along with it they enter the land of stories by kind of falling into the storybook which is kind of like falling into it like they've got the book they're reading the book and then they're able to just fall inside the book uh it's a little bit of a cheap kind of plot device, but to this book's credit, it has enough self-awareness to make fun of itself. Uh, at one point, the children are talking and the boy said, oh, boy, um, Dorothy got the tornado to bring her to Oz. Alice in Wonderland fell through the rabbit hole. Uh, the children in Narnia went through the wardrobe. And we just fell into the book. He says, ours is the lamest story of all. Um, so kind of a bit of a bit of a meta humor in the book. Um, at least it has a good grace to make fun of itself. Once they're in the land of stories, then the plot becomes how do they get back to the real world or to, to their world where their mother and grandmother are waiting. Uh, and they find out that there's a special wishing spell that will grant you anything you want, including kind of bringing you back to your world. But in order to cast this spell, you have to collect all these magical items like uh, Cinderella's glass slipper and one of the jewels from Snow White's coffin. Oh, right. So, like, in case it's not clear, like, the premise behind the land of stories is this is the land where all the fairy tales are from. They kind of just lump all the fairy tales together. So the Brothers Grimm and Hans Christian Andersen and Mother Goose and a few, I think, of Aesop's fables are even kind of mixed in here. Just kind of all the stories are in this land. So um, they've got to get all these things for the wishing spell. And to get them, they have to kind of travel all over the land of stories to the different kingdom. Which, again, if you wanted to make a complaint, that's a bit of a contrived plot. I think the, you know, the literature professors or film, film professors call this a MacGuffin, which is... Just kind of a contrived thing that drives forward the plot. But whatever. You know, that's, that's kind of the genre you're kind of going for anyways. To me, what was the best thing about this book, in, in spite of the fact that the dialogue wasn't great and that the plot was a bit contrived, was just the setting. And I think Chris Colford does a good job of just kind of bringing this world of fantasy to life. Now, uh, granted, I think he's, he's kind of created a situation where the reader is doing most of the work. 
because the reader is already familiar with the idea of fairy tales and the image of the land of fairy tales. So the reader kind of brings these preconceived notions in about magical forests and kind of fairy kingdoms and kind of small town, you know, towns and villages like Cinderella's town or Snow White's town. Uh, and so he doesn't need a lot of description to bring this to life. And he, he, he doesn't use it. He doesn't use a lot. He uses it uh, kind of very sparing with a couple paragraphs that do just kind of enough to evoke those kind of images you already have. So I found the setting very immersive and pleasurable and I was kind of able to kind of lose myself in this fairy tale esque setting. Perhaps this is best illustrated by example. So I'm just going to read a bit. This is, they're in the kingdom of fairies, which is the, well, kingdom where the fairies are. And uh, they're describing kind of what it's like. And I'll just read from this here. They reached the heart of the kingdom and were completely bewildered by what they saw. It was like they were standing in a giant tropical garden with large, colorful flowers of all shapes and species. There were weeping willows over small ponds and vines that grew across the ground and up the trees. There were beautiful bridges over many streams and ponds. Uh, it goes on to talk about their homes and the fairies and the mushrooms and the fairies and the trees. But you know, you, it's not much, but it's enough to kind of evoke that image of kind of a beautiful little fairy kingdom, the bridges, the ponds, the willows, the mushrooms. It gets the job done. Uh, and so I, I loved kind of the setting of the book. Um, the weak point is, okay, I already said the plot is a MacGuffin, but that's okay. The weak point for me was kind of the, the little episodes along the way. So there's the overall arching plot, but there's also all the little adventures they get to along the way. And these little adventures to me were always underwhelming. The setup was interesting, kind of, but the payoff was just awful, like really boring or lame or underimaginative. Example. So they're traveling along, they get captured by the goblins and trolls. Uh, and the goblins and trolls kind of take them into their minds where they're kind of put in a prison with all the other human prisoners. Okay, interesting setup. And then you think, okay, now how are they going to get out of this one? Are they going to have to use their wits or think of an escape thing? Or And then it turns out that one of the girl trolls is in love with Connor, the, the boy twin. And the girl troll kind of comes up and says, I'll free you if you give me a kiss. And Connor says, oh, yuck, I'm not giving you a kiss. And then his sister makes him do it. And thought, ah, oh, this is just stupid. Like, well, what a stupid way to resolve this, this little plot point. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of them were like that. The, they encountered, like, the witch from the Hansel and Gretel story, the one with the gingerbread house. And she was going to eat them, and then they just kind of said, well, wait a minute, you can't because of the Section 32 of the Fairy Code. You have to grant us one last wish. And I thought, oh, stupid. What, what a stupid ending to that little thing. Uh, or they're going to cross the bridge, and they encountered the troll, and the, it was a stupid riddle that, I don't know. It, it, it's just all these kind of little mini episodes have very stupid, stupid payoffs. Uh, and I, that's the part of the book I thought was kind of the weakest. But I kept reading. It, it's readable enough. Um, I forgot to mention this earlier, but I, I was perhaps unfair to characterize a plot as simply a MacGuffin, like them going around and collecting stuff. There's actually a few other things happening in the story to keep things interesting. There's a story of Goldilocks, who is like since her adventures with the bears kind of become an outlaw and is hunted by the police. So Goldilocks is trying to get hunt, escape from the police or the, not the police, the soldiers. 
Um, and then the evil queen from the Snow White story has escaped from prison and is plotting something. You don't know what at the beginning of the book, but all the fairy tale characters like uh, Snow White's army and Cinderella's army are looking for the evil queen. So you have these kind of few things going on and they all come together at the end for a climactic battle. And to give credit where credit is due, that climactic battle is, a, is really good actually. Like uh, I know I said like all the resolutions was stupid, but the ending resolution, that big final battle, there's a big fight and kind of a crumbling castle where there's a lot of different stuff going on and a lot of different characters, kind of all the kind of characters come together, all the goodies, all the baddies uh, fighting each other in different parts of the castle. Um, I was looking at Rick Wikipedia and apparently this is in development for a film. Of course, everything's in development for a film and kind of half of it doesn't pan out. But if this ever gets made into a film, I think that could work. Like that, that big kind of action sequence in the castle at the end could be a really exciting film sequence. So yeah, we'll have to see if that pans out as a film or not. Um, yeah, I think it could work. Um, yeah, what else is there in here? Oh, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a few kind of what are supposed to be surprise reveals as you kind of get closer to the end. We're like a few things that are supposed to surprise you along the way. I saw these coming a mile away, but then, you know, it's a kid's book and I'm an adult. So maybe, maybe the target audience uh, would be more surprised by this. I don't know. Um, I don't necessarily say that as a bad thing, though. I mean, the fact that I was able to see these reveals were coming. I, I was reading an article about this, and they said, you know, people get kind of so mad when they can guess the surprise plot twist in advance. But they said you shouldn't be mad when you can guess the plot twist in advance because that just means that the author is playing fair. They're kind of leaving hints for you to discover. And if you can discover those hints and kind of predict the plot twist, fair enough. He said what you should be angry about is when the plot twist comes totally out of left field and the author's done no work at all to set it up. He's like, that, those are the kind of plot twists you should be angry about. The ones you can predict, it's, it's almost fair enough. The author is playing a little game with you. Uh, the author is playing fair. The plot twist will, will make sense in light of the hints that have come before it. So in that regard, uh, I, you, know, you can't be angry about it. Sure, it's a little bit obvious, but um, it's set up very early on. The hints are kind of laid out there. So then when you finally get to it, it it's consistent with all the hints that have kind of come before. Um, what else to talk about? That, that might be about it. I don't know. There's one other little thing that kind of caught my eye here. Again, my kind of embarrassment at reading this at 40 years of age and reading a kid's book. Uh, but there's a quote right at the very beginning by C.S. Lewis. It says, Someday you will be old enough to start reading fairy tales again by C.S. Lewis, right at the beginning of the book, huh? So it's like Chris Coffer knew I would be embarrassed about reading this book, and he just kind of put that part in, just right for me. But I thought about it a bit, and I thought, you know, maybe there's a lot of truth to this, right? Because when you're a little kid, you love these fairy tales. And then when you become a teenager, you know, 17, 18, 19, or you're into your 20s, you don't have time for these fairy tales because you're out kind of exploring the world and, and experiencing the wider world and going on adventures. And that's kind of like experiencing and having adventures is kind of what you're up to. And then you start getting old and kind of, you know, around your late 30s, 40s, you don't want to go out so much anymore. You're fine, perfectly fine staying at home. Going out to clubs and stuff is just beginning to get a little bit boring. Uh, you lose a little bit of energy maybe, you start getting tired easier. And then maybe that's the time of your life when once again, 
you start rediscovering fairy tales and you want to kind of get immersed in the, these stories of these fantasy stories again. Yeah, maybe. <clears throat> maybe that's what C.S. Lewis was referring to. So maybe it's not all bad picking this book up when, when you're older. Um, for all my complaints, I found the world that it created was an enchanting world that I enjoyed kind of uh, losing myself in. Um, and uh, I found it a pleasant enough read. So yeah, I'll give it a recommendation. Okay.